Welcome to the December 12, 2016 meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Would the town clerk please administer the oath of office for our newly elected officials? That's right. Okay, if Caitlin Jordan and Penelope Jordan would join me in the front, please. Could we please have the roll call? Councilor Garvin? Here. Councilor Grennan? Here. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Here. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Here. Councilor Lennon? Here. Councilor Ray? Here. And Councilor Sullivan? Here. Item number one, election of the town council chair. The caucus has recommended James Jamie Garvin. Do I have a motion? I move that we elect um, James Jamie Garvin as chair um, for the town council for the coming year, 2017. Is there a second? Second. Councilor Lennon. All those in favor? Congratulations, Jamie. Thank you. You're now the new council chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, first, uh, next item up is uh, number 1A-2017. It's a special rec recognition that we have. And uh, I'm going to turn to Councillor Sullivan to introduce that item. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Garvin, uh, I move that we uh, install a plaque in the town council chambers to read as follows. 
This room is dedicated to Michael K. McGovern in honor of his dedicated service to the citizens of Cape Elizabeth as town manager from May 1985 to December 2016. Seeing the motion, is there a second, Kathy? Second, please. Is there any discussion? If I yes, may, I, I have a few words. Please. I'm sure other councils do as well, but I'd like to begin. Uh, in advance of those words, I do want to mention that the public had a wonderful celebration of Mike's service to Cape Elizabeth. This was held last week on Tuesday, December 6, at the Pahutuk Club. The public was invited, presentations were made, and about 200 people attended, including many former town, uh, town employees and town councilors. From 1978, as assistant town manager and since becoming town manager in 1985, Mike has attended well over 1,000 regular town council meetings and workshops, in addition to all of his work during daytime hours. That's a lot of night meetings. Tonight, December 12, 2016, is Mike's last regular town council meeting. And for some of us, it just doesn't seem possible. Under Mike's guidance and leadership for the last 31 years, Cape Elizabeth has grown steadily as a vibrant community with outstanding fiscal management, municipal services, facilities, and schools, while maintaining its historical roots and character. Mike has served with 56 town councilors. He has been an outstanding manager and gifted leader who has consistently inspired us all, employees, volunteers, and elected officials, to serve the Cape, people of Cape Elizabeth to the very best of our abilities. These are all tremendous achievements, yet I believe that Mike's legacy of service to our town will be something even greater and less tangible. Mike has consistently promoted transparency and integrity in municipal process. As a result, he leaves us all with a, a legacy of faith in local government. These McGovern years, this McGovern era, will be the standard of excellence for Cape Elizabeth's future. Thank you, Mike. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion on the floor to dedicate these chambers in honor of Michael K. McGovern and his dedicated service to the citizens of Cape Elizabeth, all those in favor? It's unanimous and very well deserved. Congratulations. Uh, at this point, the chair will also recognize Senator, State Senator Rebecca Millett, who's joined us tonight with a special proclamation. Please come to the podium. And Representative Kim Monahan, thank you. I assume that's me. <laughs> uh, the school board's gone upstairs. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> that's a good guess, Mike. <laughs> yep, sorry, it's not for you. It's <laughs> Um, good evening, everyone, and um, it is a pleasure and a shock to be here with this legislative sentiment. Um, I know uh, we would like to read this because it's actually short and we don't have 20 of them like we usually do for the school, the school board. Um, Kim, do you want to start with some? Sure, sure, thanks. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, I was just thinking, Mike, well, he hasn't served as long as I've lived here, but he's, he's served long, he's like more than half the time that um, myself and my family have, have lived here. And I can tell you on behalf of myself and my whole family, um, you've been so good to everybody in our family and our uh, the relatives, and uh, we really do appreciate it. And um, as from one public servant to another, I can honestly say that one of the great um, attributes of, of public services is the ability to reach out, make contact, uh, and, and try to help those that need help or just basically simply answer a question. Um, and I've always said that Mike McGovern 
within 24 hours, even if he was overseas at one of the Rotary events, he always returned my emails, answering in, uh, any question I had, uh, and I truly appreciate that, and um, I just hope our future public servants and managers can do the same because it really is important a lot of times when we have um, questions that myself or Rebecca might not have the information or be able to answer and it's wonderful to be able to reach out to our town manager and our municipal uh, folks that um, can provide us such quick feedback and we really do appreciate it and we will miss you dearly Mike yeah I hope you have a nice, I think it's wonderful what you are doing though with the Rotary and I, and I have been following it a lot with your, um, with your um, social media posts, so the best of luck to you. Yeah. Um, and I'll just briefly add um, as well that, Mike, I, I believe you have set the gold standard for public service within the municipal communities and um, many, many other people who are currently serving in that capacity look to you for guidance. I know that, I've heard that. Um, and so I, th I suspect that you'll continue to get those calls no matter where you are. Um, and, you know, I believe that I've had the pleasure of knowing and working with you in one capacity or the other for at least 15 years, if not longer, and have always been very grateful for your prompt response and, and the seriousness with which you took any of my queries. Um, and I will say that he is... Um, at, Given how many counselors he has served with, I think it's a testament to the fact that he is a true diplomat. Um, but the proof in the pudding is the fact that when he discovered that I am the granddaughter of Delmer D. Shaw, he didn't blanch in the face and go, holy fill in the blank. Um, he was very kind about my grandfather, who was probably one of the most obstreperous, cranky um, members of our community when he lived here. <laughs> And I suspect that he probably handled my grandfather just with as much grace as he handles anybody else. So um, for that, he is a true uh, diplomat and um, wonderful manager. With that, I would like to read the, the sentiment. Um, Mike, there may be something wrong with this, so I'm gonna ask, if there is, you need to let me know and we'll get this corrected, okay? Um, be it known to all that we, the members of the Senate and House of Representatives, join in recognizing Mike McGovern of Cape Elizabeth, who is retiring from serving as town manager of Cape Elizabeth. Mr. McGovern started working for the town as an intern in the summer of 1977. Wow. Okay. Some of the changes he has overseen include the development of Fort Williams Park in Portland Headlight. He has served as president of the Maine Municipal Association and as a board member of Eco Maine, and has been an active volunteer with Rotary International. We extend to Mr. McGovern our appreciation for his long service and offer him our congratulations on his retirement, and be it ordered that this official expression of sentiment be sent forthwith on behalf of the 127th Legislature and the people of the state of Maine, and it's signed by the President of the Senate, the Speaker of the House, Secretary of Senate, and the Clerk of the House, and sponsored by myself and Representative Monaghan and Representative Hammond, who regretfully couldn't be here this evening. Mike, all the best of luck thank and you. thank you. Thank you both very much for that. We will move on to the report from the Finance Committee. Kathy uh, or Jessica or Mike? I first <laughs> defer to the others. I'll always defer to Mike. As we're transitioning responsibilities in I'll, more ways than one. I will have my first report in January. Very well. Just very briefly, very pleased that uh, Moody's and S&P recently looked at the town at, in for our bond ratings and uh, standard and poor's uh, just uh, rated Cape Elizabeth as a triple A rating, which is good. Uh, Moody's is double A one, which is uh, the best any town our size can get. So it just uh, shows that things are in good shape and it's good, uh, you know, going forward that uh, the town, when it borrows money, such as the refuse disposal project that's doing tomorrow, uh, we'll get the, the best favorable rates possible. Thank you. Great. Any questions on that? Seeing none. Uh, citizen opportunity for discussion of items not on the agenda. Is there anybody here tonight that would like to speak about something that is not on the agenda? Okay, seeing none, we'll move along. 
Mike, your final town manager's monthly report. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Garvin. I, you know, I could, I could go on and on, and just I'm not going to do that. <laughs> uh, what I'd like to do is, you know, I, I wrote something up that's available online. I'm, I'm just going to read the first half of it and the end of it. Uh, you know, to, and what I want to emphasize, tonight is really a, a historic night. Uh, this marks the convening of the 50th Town Council since the adoption of the Council Manager Charter uh, in November of 1967. Uh, since the council was formed, 59 citizens have served on the council. 21 of the 59, or 36%, have been women. Looks like women are doing better of late. <laughs> uh, interestingly enough, we've had a father and a daughter. That would be Penny and Billy. Uh, a brother and a sister, uh, Jessica and her brother Bill. And we've had two brothers, uh, Doug and uh, Dick Tinsman. But none of them ever served at the same time on the council. Uh, you know, you wonder how long folks serve. Uh, Eighteen uh, have served for a for one term or a partial term. Uh, six individuals have served for a while and then come back. And I look over this way: both Sarah and Penny, uh, both both fit that category. They're the two of the six. Uh, three council members since the late '60s have served for parts of four decades. Uh, the longest serving was William H. Jordan, Jr., no surprise there, uh, who served for 26 years on the council, plus six as, as a selectman. Next longest serving, for some of you met her the other night, was Betty Carson, uh, who served for 16 years. Uh, seven council members have gone on to serve in the main legislature after the service on the town council. They are Steve Simons, Mary Webster, Jane Amaro, Nancy Masterton, Janet McLaughlin, Jean Gidmarvin, and Cynthia Dill. And I, I can't go without saying, the most common last name in the council has been Jordan. <laughs> uh, with Bill Jordan, Dick Jordan, Lester Jordan, Penny Jordan, and Caitlin Jordan. And you know, there's, there's probably others, but you know, who knows. Uh, there have been five town managers since 1968, number of acting ma managers. And you know, I've had the privilege of knowing 58 of the 59 individuals who have served on the town council. And I've served in one capacity or another with 56 of the 59. So, you know, it's uh, you know, really been a tremendous group. And I think that you know, things work well in the community because the citizens have elected such fine councilors. And, and I, th I think it's worth noting uh, that this is the 50th town council. And those of you serving this year, should be particularly proud uh, of that fact and the importance of it and uh, how well generally the, the governing uh, works. You know, so you know, in, in closing, I, I, you know, I, I, I wrote some other things that I'm not gonna read because I might get a little emotional over it. But anyway, I just wanna thank everyone. Uh, it's, it's been a wonderful run. Uh, I've worked with tremendous elected officials, tremendous department heads, tremendous staff. Uh, tremendous citizens, uh, peers in, in other communities, and you know so many people uh, who who work in local government to to try to make things better. Uh, you know, I, I never dreamed when I came here uh, all those years ago as an intern in 1977 uh, that that I would retire from here. Uh, but you know, I've never regretted a day. Uh, I think a lot of good things have been accomplished. There have been, you know, some disappointments along the way. There's been a lot of night meetings that maybe I would have preferred to stay home. Uh, but you know, all in all, uh, you know, I, I just am extremely appreciative of having had this opportunity and serving uh, what I think is, if not the finest, you know, one of the finest communities anywhere. So, thank you. Thank you very much. I commented to Jessica earlier, I find it appropriate that on the night of your last meeting, we have no less than almost 40 <laughs> agenda <laughs> items. So we're, uh, we've got a full, full agenda ahead, and, and I think you'd have it no other way. Um, one little, thing. A little bit of clearing the deck involved. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> one thing um, I want to just circle back to were there any town council reports or correspondence that anybody wanted to address? We skipped over that. 
I just wanted to come back to that. I actually wanted to make mention of two things. Uh, I specifically wanted to applaud Deborah Lane and Patty Grennan for the hard work that they put in on the event that was referenced earlier last week at the Papuda Club. It was a fantastic event. Um, everybody who was there clearly enjoyed themselves, and uh, I know that none of those things ever happen without people behind the scenes doing a lot of hard work, and so I wanted to recognize you both for that and express my appreciation. I also wanted to congratulate Councillor Lennon. Um, I had the good fortune of participating as an audience member at the TEDx uh, youth event at the high school um, a couple of Fridays ago, and it was an incredibly amazing event. I know, Sarah, that you've put in a lot of time and effort, and many other people did as well, but uh, I was overwhelmed uh, and impressed by it and wanted to uh, congratulate you on a, on a terrific event and uh, ask that you extend uh, that uh, that feedback to the rest of your group because it was fantastic. Thank you, that's very thoughtful. Um, so moving along on the agenda, we have the review of draft minutes from the November 14th, 2016 meeting. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? Jessica? I so move. Is there a second? Second. Any? Any discussion? All those in favor? It's unanimous. Item number 2-2017, adoption of the town council rules. Mike, do you want to introduce this, or is there anything that we need? No, just these are the annual rules. There's no proposed amendments. I am going to be working with uh, Councillor Caitlin Jordan on a proposed amendment for, for the council to consider at a future meeting. Okay. Is there a motion to adopt the town council rules as we have them here currently? Sarah? So moved. Second. Patty? Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? It's unanimous. Item number 3-2017, appointment of the Finance Committee. <clears throat> Can I have a motion uh, to appoint Jessica Sullivan as chairman of the, the uh, chairman of the committee and as the council of, as the whole to serve as the Finance Committee? So moved. Caitlin? Second. Second. Penny? Yeah. All those in favor? Oh, I'm sorry, is there any discussion? All those in favor? <laughs> Unanimous. Item number 4-2017, appointment of an ordinance committee. Seeking a motion to uh, appoint Patty Grennan as chairman and Caitlin Jordan and Kathy Ray as members. Can I have a motion? So moved. Caitlin, second. Sarah? All those, any discussion? All those in favor? That's unanimous. Item number 5-2017, appointment of an appointments committee. Seeking a motion to appoint Sarah Lennon as chairman and Penny Jordan and Jessica Sullivan as members. Is there a motion? So moved. Caitlin, seconded? Second. Penny, any discussion? All those in favor? That's unanimous. The rest of items number six, through 17-2017, it is recommended that we uh, consider those on block. I will be looking for a single motion to approve these items, but if anybody is interested in removing any of them for separate discussion and vote, you are entitled to do so. Uh, is there a motion to uh, approve items number six through 17-2017 on block? Jessica? Yes, I move that we uh, uh, consider items 16 through 17 on block. Is there a second? Second. Patty, is there any discussion? Just one. I just want to mention amongst those is item 16, the code of ethics. And the council will be asked as, as for approving this item uh, to, to sign the annual uh, attestation uh, that they've read and understand the council's code of ethics. Thank you. Is there any other discussion? I would just point out, too, that item number 17, uh, for anybody watching or following along, is uh, our recommended meeting schedule. So if folks are interested in when we'll be gathering, there you have it. If there is no other discussion, uh, all those in favor? That's unanimous. And item number 18-2017, the appointments to boards and committees. Uh, before us is a slate of... Uh, recommended appointees. I'm going to turn it over to Patty Grennan uh, to introduce this as outgoing chair of the Appointments Committee. Yeah, great. Um, thank you, Jamie. I uh, 
We just finished up our annual appointments process. We had um, an incredible amount of people come forward. We had 31 people interview for 16 available positions um, in our community. And as always, I'm always impressed with the caliber um, of people that come through the door. Not only are they incredibly um, you know, gracious and smart and um, willing to give their time, but um, just, uh, you know, just a really good group of people from our community. So um, unfortunately, we can't um, appoint everybody. Um, and if we could, we would. So with that, on behalf of the Appointments Committee, I move to appoint the citizens listed in the attached slate to various boards and committees with new terms beginning January 1st, uh, 2017. Thank you, Patty. Is there a second? Second. Sarah? Public comment. Uh, thank you, Councilor Jordan. Uh, is there any comment from the public on uh, this item? Could you please come forward to the podium? Uh, well, uh, is this involving the Harbor Commission appointments? It's for all of the appointments that are before us. Could you just please give us your name and address? And if you could limit your comments to about three minutes. My name is Edward Perry. I live at 10 Pine Ridge Road in Cape Elizabeth. Uh, I'm a commercial fisherman here in the Cape. Uh, and as a community, the commercial fishermen were, are, that are here were very concerned about uh, the, the appointments on who is going to be on the Harbor Commission and we were very disappointed to hear that uh, although three people involved with the fishing community applied, none of them were chosen. And all that we're hoping is that uh, this is a very important commission to us and that, uh, that the people who are chosen uh, give us a chance to have some input on any decisions that are going to involve uh, us, the harbor, harbor access, and so on. And, and we certainly realize that there's other factions who use the harbor and, and share it with us. And uh, we hope that we'll all be able to make some input into those decisions. And that's my comments. Thank you very much. OK. Is there any other comment from the public? Discussion by the council? Any comments? I have uh, a question. Oh, uh, just to uh, Mr. Perry's point, and I'm not questioning decisions, but there, uh, if there were uh, people who were uh, fishermen who applied, um, and I, I, I know many of the people who were selected on this list, uh, what was the discussion and rationale? So what the rationale was that we did, um, we looked at a balance of people on the committee to um, come forth with the understanding that, of course, the, uh, the people from the fishing community would be engaged in the process. It would be the only way to go forth and, and, and um, kind of flesh out things. But we also thought that one of the um, individuals did come forth and said that they do do some um, lobstering commercial fishing, um, which is Stephen Culver, and he's part of the wet team in Cape Elizabeth. So we thought that we had struck the right balance. Uh, certainly the point is well taken, and we'll be sure, um, I'm sure, with um, Caitlin Jordan, who's going to be the liaison, um, that there will be um, a good uh, opportunity and, I think, intent to reach out to the fishing community. I would assume so. I would just add, um, in agreement with Councilor Grennan, whether it's the Harbors Committee or any of the committees, um, having been on the Appointments Committee with Council Ray and Council Grennan, um, we definitely looked to, with all of them, strike a balance to be representative of the community as a whole. Um, so as Councilor Grennan said, uh, we do have somebody who indicated um, uh, that he was a fisherman, uh, along with having some other positive attributes too that we thought uh, that were uh, well represented there. I think if you look across the slate of all of these, you'll see um, folks that really represent the entire community and not just segments of it, which was part of our goal. Um, the other thing I would remind folks of is that all of the work that this committee will do is open to the public and your participation and uh, engagement is highly encouraged as well. So the meetings are open um, and, and so on and so forth. So um, 
even we, we said this to every candidate we met with actually uh, that even if you're not selected to be on a committee that doesn't stop you from participating and engaging in the work that they're doing so um, highly encourage anybody on any of these that are of interest to to reach out and get involved um, are there any other comments or um, questions from those on the council seeing none all those in favor of the slate as presented here it's unanimous thank you and thank you to all the citizens that came forward uh, looking forward to the year ahead working with the uh, uh, committees and their new members Next item up is number 19-2017, uh, recommendation uh, to approve the annual malt, Venus, and spiritus licenses for the Perputic Club. I don't see anybody here from the Perputic Club. Uh, Chairman Garvin, yes. point of information. Yes. I'm a member of the Perputic Club. Thank you very much. Anybody concerned with Thank you very much. Um, seeing nobody here from Pabudic, is there a motion to uh, recommend the approval of their license? Oh, we have one here. oh I'm sorry. Yeah. Did you, was there anything that you wanted to say? No, no I'm the treasurer of the ASA question. My apologies, I didn't. No, no. Um, so is there uh, a motion to approve the license? Sarah, seconded? Uh, oh, question. I was going to make a motion. Is it already done? I move that we approve the annual malt, Venus, and spiritual license uh, for the Paputic Club this for the coming year. Thank you very much. Is there a second? Patty? Any discussion? All those in favor? That's unanimous. We'll move on to the next item, 20-2017. Uh, same recommended approval for Rudy's of the Cape. Is there anybody here from Rudy's? No. Caitlin? Oh, just point of information. Um, my family also does business with Rudy's throughout the summer. Thank you very much. Is there anybody that's concerned with that? Thank you. I have a motion to approve the annual malt license. Sarah? Uh, I move we approve the annual malt, Venice, and spirits license for Rudy's of the Cape located at 517 Ocean House Road. Thank you very much. Is there a second? I'll second. Jessica, is there any discussion? All those in favor? Unanimous. Next item, number 21-2017, the acceptance of annual gifts. Deborah? Absolutely. Before you, you have a list of uh, gifts, both monetary gifts and in kind, that the town has received during the past year uh, for the many different departments. It ranges from local fuel assistance to uh, library and the library project, uh, Family Fund Day, the Rescue Fund, Spurwink Church, Fort Williams Park, uh, Museum at Portland Headlight, uh, the Garden Club. So it's a, a, a vast list and we, we thank these uh, folks and individuals and companies for coming uh, through and supporting the town in, in many different ways uh, throughout the last year. Thank you very much. Is there a motion to accept the gifts with appreciation? Jessica? I move that we accept uh, <clears throat> these annual gifts with appreciation and thanks for our generous citizens. Is there a second? Second. Any? Any discussion? Discussion? Yeah. Um, I want to let the council know that I'm a member of the South Portland Cape Elizabeth Rotary Club. However, I'm not a member of the board, so I do not make decisions, so. Thank you very much. Any other discussion? All those in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you very much. And again, thank you to all those citizens and organizations and companies for their generosity. It's much appreciated. Uh, the next item up is uh, number 22-2017, the draft sign ordinance. Councillor Caitlin Jordan, would you like to introduce that, please? I can. We undertook rewriting the sign ordinance after the Reed decision, Reed v. Gilbert, came down from the Supreme Court in June of 2015. The ordinance committee met six times, and we determined that the easiest way to approach this, and I'm not sure it was really that easy, but was to rewrite the sign ordinance and, and try and start from scratch basically we went with the idea of 
making sure we were compliant with the U.S. Supreme Court decision, tried to make the ordinance a little more user friendly so people could look into, read it and understand what they were allowed to do and not do. Um, and we tried to accommodate as best we could the existing signage that was currently being utilized inside the town. In order to do that, we structured the, the ordinance by location, which was an approved way of doing it through the Reed decision. In that, we also had discussions about electronic message boards. It was the Ordinance Committee's recommendation that we not um, allow electronic message boards through in the, within the town. We also discussed um, banners across roadways and decided to continue the ban by not, they've never been allowed, so we decided to continue with that. Um, along with our recommendation of the ordinance that we've put forward, we're also recommending that the town, um, this would go through our new manager, I imagine, that they look at other town policies that regard messages on municipal message boards so that they also are held to the same read compliant. And unless anyone has any questions, I move that we, it's set to move to a public hearing. I thought we might need a workshop, but if we want to have a public hearing first to hear from the public and then bring it to a workshop, I think this took a lot for the ordinance committee to understand and go through. We had to send it off to the attorney to have it reviewed and a little further explanation. So it might be necessary to bring everybody up to the same speed, but I also think it might be important to get input from the public first so that we don't have to have two workshops. So I move that we set this for a public hearing for it January 9th, 2017. Great. Thank you. Is there a second? Sarah? Any discussion? Okay, seeing no. questions. Yeah, I'd just like to say for the public's benefit that this is, uh, we did this to be proactive. Uh, the, the sign ordinance has been an ordinance that we've recognized for, for a while needed to be uh, revised or redone. Um, and the Supreme, U.S. Supreme Court, uh, Court decision, Reed versus Gilbert, really. Uh, put that on the fast track for us. Given we were already looking at redoing this, it made sense to, to deal with this right away. And what this means is that signs cannot be regulated by content. Uh, and this is causing municipalities across the United States to deal with this. So we can regulate signs in the town of Cape Elizabeth by time, manner, and location, but not by content. So any sign in our ordinance that you see now regulated can say anything. And so we had to proceed with that understanding and compliance with this new U.S. Supreme Court decision. So I just wanted to, especially for folks at home, uh, the council's read, read this and will be understanding it and probably already does, but it, it, it was um, quite, quite a task. <laughs> Can I ask a question just so people in the community uh, maybe understand? There, there's a grandfathering to existing signs, is that true? Correct. Okay. There's a permitting procedure. If you have a, once this ordinance goes into effect, if you have a non-conforming sign that's pre-existing, then you, should document it so that should something happen to your sign and you need to replace it, then you're able to replace it. You have, I believe we put in six months, a six month window from so, say, you know, we get a wild tornado come through Cape Elizabeth and it takes out your sign. You want to have your non-conforming sign documented so that you can prove to the code enforcement officer that you had a pre-existing non-conforming sign that you would like to replace. And you have a six month window to do that once your sign is damaged. Or perhaps it just needs to be repaired. This, we put in this grandfathering so that if your sign starts to fall apart, you don't feel like you have to keep the same decrepit sign up. You can replace it so that we have nice, new, not, dangerous signs around town. Mm -hmm. Good. So 
Karen. I just like to give a public thanks to our town planner, Maureen O'Mara. She was incredible in this. We would muddle around and vaguely express what we wanted, and she'd help us understand, and then she'd come back the next week with this perfect and concise, <laughs> understandable, and legal prose that we could then discuss more. So thank you, Maureen. We, we, we relied on you heavily. Any other discussion? <coughs> All those in favor of the motion on the table to uh, refer the recommendations of the Ordinance Committee pertaining to the draft sign ordinance to a public hearing on Monday, January 9th, 2017. Those in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you to the Ordinance Committee for your hard work on that. Uh, next item, 23-2017. Uh, the Town Center Potential Sidewalk Grant. Uh, our town planner, Maureen O'Meara, is here. Maureen, do you want to come up and introduce these items? This and the subsequent ones? So don't go anywhere. Want the two-minute summary? Yes. Okay. So uh, the town has a town center plan, and you have a town center zoning. This reflects the town center map that's in that plan. And when you adopted the, the uh, new plan, you also created something called a TIF district. And the TIF district that was adopted in the town of Cape Elizabeth does not benefit a specific business. I just want to make that very, very clear. But what it does is every year more money is accumulating in this fund. And it was set up specifically to spend the money on pedestrian improvements and stormwater improvements. So the thinking is that the money you're collecting is never really going to be enough to do anything really significant. But if you use it as a cash match with a grant application, you can actually start to have some real money and do some real projects. So the Portland Area Compre Comprehensive Transportation Study is now doing its two-year grant cycle. Um, if you were to apply for a grant due February 3rd, 2017, the, the construction money would be available in 2020. So we're really looking in the future. And the proposal is to take uh, what we estimate would be about $75,000 in the TIF account, and we don't know the exact amount because it's based on the assessed value in the town center. So we're, we're making some assumptions about how values will increase and properties will be redeveloped. But take that money, take about another 50000 in your CIP, use it as a cash match, and apply for money to finish this sidewalk here in front of the shopping center and then on the other side of sea salt to take that um, sidewalk and take it all the way down to Fowler Road. So this would be a significant improvement on, in completing the sidewalks in the town center. We know we've got school children walking through here. Um, so this would be an opportunity to really maximize the money you already have. And uh, in order to get this application done in time, Staff really needs indication now whether we should start working on it. And there's a couple of pieces. One of the pieces is the PACS is a regional transportation organization, and when you're com the, the grant application process is very competitive. So we're doing the best we can to make our application very competitive. And there's a couple of ways to do that. One is we have reached out to the city of South Portland and the city of Portland. We're in the same sub-region of PACS. And they have agreed that they are also going to package similar pedestrian improvement projects, and we put them together in one package. And what that does is it turns this into a regional project. We get a check for that. Um, the second piece, which is another item after this item on your agenda, is for communities that have a complete streets policy, we get an extra check under the grant application. So um, what we're asking for tonight is for you to generally understand what's being asked and to authorize staff to submit a grant application. Thank you, Maureen. Can I ask you a question? Sarah? The part of the sidewalk that goes in front of the shopping center, does that take out the growth in trees or is that just take out part of the shoulder? It doesn't have to take out the trees. I actually met with Pete Gellerson, who is the manager uh, for the property, the shopping center property, and we were out there measuring with tape a couple of years ago, and we, we, we both feel confident that we can weave a sidewalk around there. There was only one 
um, piece of vegetation we thought would have to be removed and it was dying. So we would not need to remove those trees. Good. Any other questions for Maureen? Is there a motion to authorize the application for the grant? Patty? So moved. Is there a second? Sarah? Any discussion? Jessica? Yep. Um, if, so we would be applying for this with Portland, South Portland, and somehow our, uh, what we would receive potentially as an award would be spelled out in advance. Okay. Now, if, if we apply for this as a region, and let's just say, for example, that we don't have all our checks checked off, but they do. Is there, how does that, how does it weigh in? Uh, you know, I just. Some of the fine tuning we're working on right now, I can tell you South Portland has their engineer already cranking out the numbers. Portland is still picking out the project they want to do. We know what we want to do. We need to refine the numbers. We're just going to package this, honestly, uh, you know, we're going to do the best we can to make this a very, very competitive project. Uh, the way the PACS application project, it project is organized, each sub-region, and there's four, gets to pick. They have ten points that they can assign as they see fit. And the hope is that most, if not all, of those ten points would be assigned to this particular project. So we're doing everything we can to make it competitive. Now, included in that, that I, I read in the documents, uh, and I remember this from our town center plan and some earlier work we had done, uh, would be the stormwater, uh, the drainage issues that are, that are near Fowler Road, right? Yeah, this is the one that has more, I mean, we've actually talked a lot about yeah. this project. And we actually had an estimate done, it's 2007, so we need to buff that up a little. This one, we, we had estimate work done on this one when we did the town center stormwater plan, which was 2014, I think. So this one, we got a lot newer numbers. But both of them have stormwater elements, um, which I think also will help with the, com the competitiveness. For example, this piece had actually talked about um, doing some rain gardens, which is a low impact development. Uh, method and that is another place where you can get some points in the grant competition. Well, that, that's good to know because I mean I saw that, but I remember distinctly some very pointed discussions about that. So, would so my question is, mm -hmm. would in that application mm -hmm. were we to be awarded this? Yes. Would that take care of the, the storm water? water and drainage issues that have been of concern. Would that take care of all of them? We would try to do all of it, yes. Thanks. Are there any other questions, discussion? I have, I don't want to like, um, my understanding is there's a relationship to the next agenda item. Yes. Around complete streets. Yes. Are they mutually exclusive or? You could do one without the other. Okay, okay. And I would assume that that uh, just knowing, watching what's happening in Portland and South Portland, that they already have complete street policy. Um, I'm, I, I'm honestly, I know they've both discussed it. I, I'm almost certain that uh, South Portland has one already, and I'm almost certain Portland has one already. Portland, I mean, if you're driven around there and you see the green strips and the stencil yep. bikes, they've, they've come a long way from even five years ago. But we could, we could say that move ahead with funding, with agreeing to uh, applying for PACs, um, and then the next item is exclusive of that. Yes, you, you could authorize staff to uh, move ahead with the application and then decide not to adopt a complete streets policy. You could decide to delay adoption of a complete streets policy until next month in order to give yourself time for a public hearing. Um, if you could in some way adopt a complete streets policy by February 3rd, that will help with the grant application. Okay. That's what I wanted to understand. Okay. Great. Any other comments or questions? Seeing none. Yeah, I, the city of Portland adopted one in 2012, December 17th. Okay. 
Seeing none, all those in favor of authorizing the grant application to PACS for sidewalk improvements in the town center area. It's unanimous. Maureen, did you want to introduce anything relating to the next one? <laughs> Trying to get you your the exercise. Complete streets. Yes. Yeah. The, 24 the, seven, two, 24 2017 complete. Yeah. The, I, I will tell you that there's no magic to the policy that's in front of you. It basically is taken from the complete streets policy that was adopted by Scarborough within six months ago. And so I took theirs, I buffed it up a little, tried to make it fit Cape Elizabeth, and it's submitted for your consideration. Thank you very much. Is there a motion to refer? the draft policy the complete streets draft policy to a public hearing on monday january 9th 2017. so moved caitlin jordan is there a second patty mm -hmm. any discussion <clears throat> jessica yeah um i you know i read through all this and this is um and i'm in favor of this in concept you know from, certainly from what i've seen i'm not comfortable going to a public hearing though until uh, I know more about it and I would be very interested in having a workshop and learning a little bit more about this. It, I mean, it, you know, it looks great, but it's pretty in depth and, uh, you know, I don't know how other counselors feel, but I, I'm thinking if we go to a public hearing and we have the public coming to comment on it, I'd feel more comfortable having a better understanding. Um, there's some, there are some policy issues in here that, that I, I just would feel if, if there's a way that we could have a workshop in January, prepare for that and have um, some help with Maureen on that, I, I just feel a lot more comfortable. I, I don't know how others feel. No. Patty? Um, I can understand your concern, certainly. I think um, with talking to Maureen briefly, the goal of this is to draft a policy that is being tweaked and put out there just so that we can apply for a grant for something that's construction in 2020 and 21. Um, I personally feel like we could put this out to public hearing, listen to what they're saying, still approve it, knowing that it, we have a February deadline, knowing then we could put it in the ordinance pipeline to really tweak it and spend the, the time that we need to, the workshops and things. And so kind of sitting, putting up dual tracks, knowing what we're doing, and collecting information, but making sure that we meet that deadline. Um, so I would, I would hope that we could get it, you know, authorized so that we can move this forward and um, know with a promise that we would put it underneath the microscope and and look at it carefully. So that would be my my hope for this item. Thanks, Patty. Uh, Caitlin. I was just going to say similar to what Patty was saying. Given the the timetable, we really don't have the time to to delay on it given our, our meeting schedule unless we try to put it onto, you know, a topic for, we have a workshop on Thursday, correct? I mean, just to give a little more background, maybe it's worth half an hour of a conversation just if, if that would help, but pushing it off, <coughs> might as well just take it off because if we don't get it done by February 3rd, did she say, then it doesn't get counted in the grants application and we wouldn't need it anyhow. So it looks like we can approve it and like every other policy, if something comes up later, because nothing's going to be taken into effect immediately, it just needs to be completed for this application. So we could change it in March or April if we needed to. Or next year. Or next year. I just want to raise a point of cl clarification. Um, in spite of the fact that it's showing on the website still, we don't have a workshop yeah. on Thursday. Uh, we had canceled that. We had the workshop on the 5th to do goal planning, but we don't have a workshop on the 15th. Well, let's put it um, that So that's number one. Um, Sarah, you have a question or comment? Well, it was just a suggestion. Why don't we um, have both public hearings on the 9th and then the very next workshop date, which I'm unclear where it is, but I'm assuming it's after that. We can then dig into both the sign and this streets. And really in that workshop, we're kind of just, as Patty said, getting it, understanding enough to say, well, the ordinance committee, here's what we want the ordinance committee to do. We like this, we don't like that. So try to, try to sharpen the pencil a little bit and then give it. So in other words, this is a fairly long process before this street thing is adopted. Is that, am I correct? 2020. So maybe the public hearing is more just listening to people 
with an open mind because we'll probably be around about the same level of informed as they will. Because otherwise, just because of the timetable. So I just want to make mention that so we have our council meeting on the 9th, which is what you're referring to, you know, potentially having the public hearing on. And then our first scheduled workshop is not until the 17th. Um, so I think there's some question as to whether or not there's the ability to have a public hearing, have a workshop, and then have a vote, which we don't have a meeting scheduled before the February 3rd deadline for the application. So that's, that's sort of the calendar crunch there. Patty. Okay. okay. I think maybe we're going to say the same Probably. thing. I, I really think that we, we truly can accept this as written. It's, um, if you've talked to Maureen, who does do a lot of this, we can, I think we can listen to what the feedback is at the public hearing. She's taken something from Scarborough, tweaked it to what she feels is going to be, in her mind, pretty close to what, pretty close to what we would be adopting adopt it and then like everything we can we can really put this under the microscope we don't miss the deadline and we put it through the proper channels we could take months on it we could take over we could look at it monthly for the next two years we have the time um, so i think we're to, to jam it and stress out about having workshops i know it's a little out of or what we usually don't do but i think we we, we need to meet the deadline otherwise we don't have this opportunity that would that would be my thoughts kathy yeah um I'm a little confused as to why we're doing this backwards. Um, and I'll, I'll say that um, we, we normally look at policy and the council looks at it and, you know, vets it. And how we vet it, I don't know, we can do it through ordinance or whatever. But there, I don't understand why we would approve a policy and then have um, a public hearing. I mean, that's just backwards. And I, I think about um, what Caitlin has said in the past, and this is even beyond what Caitlin has said in the past about um, having a public hearing and vo voting that night. We're talking about voting in advance of a public hearing. There's no point in having a public yeah, hearing. Yeah, I to, that's not what we're talking no, about. We're talking about just referring it to a public hearing on the night. We're not saying we're approving it. We're not, we're not looking to approve that's the That's not what I understood not what I heard Patty so. to say. Um, so I guess I no, need to understand, excuse me, said. but could we repeat what the, um, mm. what the motion was, please? The motion is to set a public hearing on the complete streets draft policy for Monday, January 9th. Okay. I think right. that's what I said. All right. We'd be having a public hearing. We'd so a public hearing is fine, but I'm not, I will right. not vote to approve this policy in advance. So I just want to clarify for everyone, we're talking about having the public hearing, potentially voting to approve it following the public hearing that evening because there is not a subsequent meeting of the council prior to the deadline of February 3rd. Right. Okay, I understand. Is everybody but clear? I, I think there is yes, a but I will also say that I will again refer back to uh, Caitlin, <laughs> who does not want to do these things, and we've talked about this in the past, so I will... I will I, I understand, I know that, I understand that we have a, you know, we need to do this prior to February. Um, um, but I just, you know, Caitlin has had a problem with this in the past and I just, you know, ask her if she's gonna have a problem with this this time. So can, can I ask you? Hold on one second. I just wanna make sure everybody, is everybody clear on what's on the table? Okay. Yes. Thank you. yes, thank you. So the, the motion on the table is to set a public hearing for the complete streets draft policy on Monday, January 9th. Penny. No, all I was going to say is that, uh, is there a way to follow a sequence of events and meet the time frame uh, that's necessary? I think so that- Mike, Mike that was just pointing out that we're, we will likely have a meeting of the council to vote on the new town manager prior to our regularly scheduled okay. February meeting. Okay. It's, you know, certainly plausible that we could add this to the agenda. Mm -hmm. if we so chose. And and then we could follow a philosophical approach that is, the night of the public hearing, we would hear information and then vote at a separate meeting. If we were to do that, yes. Okay. Um, Maureen, could I ask that you just restate 
or re-articulate what is at risk by not doing this? Some points on our competitive scoring. Can you expand upon that? I'd, I'd have to, I'd, actually, I, I could make it up, but I don't want to do that. Um, it, there's, I think there's 112 total points available, and because we're combining with other communities, um, I don't quite know how the PAC staff would do it, but you know, my job is if the town wants to submit a grant application to make it the strongest application possible. So complete streets policy, two communities have it already, we don't. It just seems like, you know, a fairly easy way to guarantee we, we capture all of the points that are available under that one line. But there's no other specific sort of quantification of the risk reward here? No. That you have. Okay. no. Thank you. Thank you. Jessica. So if this, uh, one, one thought that I had is um, if, if this is fast track, which I have issues with, but if it is, uh, and if, as Councilor Brennan suggests, that we, that when this goes to ordinance, that a policy that might potentially be fast track then gets tweaked later, isn't that a problem for the application? No. So then if it's not a problem with the application that they receive an amended uh, uh, change, potentially a material change to the policy, then why would it not be as be okay to have a policy, street, uh, complete streets policy received February 12th at the February 12th council meeting, you know, immediately thereafter, as opposed to February 3rd? It, they're I mean, it, they're I very- it's, a, it's iffy, but I'm thinking, what is one week if then they entertain material changes to something that was fast tracked in the first place? And what I'm, I'm doing here is I'm looking through the application form to see if I can find the exact number of points that you get for a complete streets policy. Uh, all I can tell you is when I submit an application for a grant, I try to follow all the rules because that's how you maximize your competitiveness. They're very, very clear that February 3rd is the deadline. So, you know, if the council's not comfortable adopting a policy, you should not do that. Um, I'm just letting you know that I'm recommending I would go for it. <laughs> well, you take a second to see if you find that score. Uh, Mike, you want yeah, to I just want to, you know, I think sometimes we get caught up in, in our own procedures and our own, in our own nomenclature for different things. You know, I'd, I'd like to suggest that maybe after January 1, but before the council meeting, that the planner and the interim manager uh, have a briefing session on this that all the councilors are invited to, uh, not mandatory attendance, not an official workshop. You know, th this whole discussion began saying you wanted more information or you wanted to make sure you understood it. You know, there's no reason we can't have a publicly advertised briefing that anyone from the public's invited to, but that doesn't have the full weight of a workshop and, accomplishes this before the meeting. And I know the council was busy, but uh, you know, I'm not sure why we, why we have to feel constricted by official workshops. And, you know, and again, it would be a briefing that everyone's invited to and publicly advertised. Caitlin? This is why Mike is going to be so missed. <laughs> <laughs> because that sounds like a doable thing for me. Let's vote. Oh, we're doing Any other questions, doing? comments? All those in favor of the motion on the table to refer the complete streets draft policy to a public hearing on Monday, January 9th, 2017. Thank you very much. Maureen, we're not done with you yet. <laughs> yeah, Maureen, just, just stand there. Next item up is number 25-2017, acceptance of an easement. So Maureen and uh, Jim Tassi, Chairman of the Conservation Committee. Good evening. Uh, so the Conservation Commission uh, would like to uh, suggest that the Council accept the easement across the Bryan property to provide connectivity between uh, the existing Greenbelt Trail and the new parcel that we just purchased this year. Uh, the easement has been surveyed and drafted up and is just awaiting council acceptance to be uh, put into effect. Thank you very much, Jim. Uh, are there any 
Well, let's have a motion first. Is there a motion to accept this easement? Jessica? I so move. Second. Patty? Discussion? Questions for Chairman Tassi? Go ahead, Jessica. I just wanted to confirm that that easement language has been approved, uh, been seen by the town attorney and approved. Yes, it was drafted by the town attorney, and, and I'm going to take this moment that, to say thank you to the Bryants. They were really wonderful to work with, and it was very nice to hear their story of how the trail system in the neighborhood evolved over time by a private property owner and their willingness to donate the easement to preserve it in perpetuity. Before we have further discussion, I want to, um, we brought this up when we were making the purchase of the Lovett Woods property. Um, I live fairly adjacent to the trail in question and, and several of the abutting property owners. Anybody have any concerns about that? Thank you. Caitlin? I just wanted to ask how we're doing on the last little piece at the end there. Are we still talking with that property owner? They not want to talk to us anymore? We're, you know, I'm an incremental person, and so we're going one step at a time. So it's a cold winter that we're beginning, and um, it's on my to-do list for next spring. <laughs> Other questions? I just was, it, it, this is really tremendous news. And, uh, you know, the, the council did a leap of faith a few months ago when it, when it purchased the other property. Uh, they, there are these other two, as has been mentioned, and uh, the Bryants just were tremendous to come forward and in, in the total spirit of public cooperation to do this. And, you know, and I also think, of, you know, with the one other party, it, as Maureen said, incremental, you know, the, you know, we don't want to put pressure on anyone. Uh, we, we would, you know, it, it's good that uh, they, they see, you know, the uses, how it's working, uh, you know, as it now stands. And, uh, you know, we, we don't want undue pressure on uh, the, the, the one remaining party that could, could close the final gap. So I really appreciate Thank the work of the Maureen and the Commission on this. The Committee. Conservation Committee now. Committee. <laughs> Thank you. We're very excited as well. Any other discussion or questions? All those in favor of the motion on the table to accept this easement. Thank you very much. And the last item that I think you're both uh, helping us out with is number 26-2017, acceptance of a license from Canterbury at the Cape Condominium Association. Yes, and again, so this is the first time the town of Cape Elizabeth will have entered into a license agreement with a private property owner. Uh, this is a really outstanding property. I don't know if anyone's ever walked on it. This is the, uh, the area that's bounded by uh, Mitchell on the east, um, Route 77 on the west, uh, Columbus on the north, and um, the, the um, Hobstone area on the south. It is, um, you know, run through with trails. It is a very beautiful natural area. It gets a lot of use already. And putting this area under town management ensures that public access will be preserved and that the property can be managed in the best possible fashion. Um, the Conservation Committee has been pursuing this for at least three years, and so we are very, very excited to get to this juncture where we've got a license agreement ready to be uh, approved by the council so that we can put this, town, uh, this property under town management. Um, Jim, just for our benefit and the public's as well, can you describe the difference between a license agreement and an easement? So a license agreement could be understood as basically the formalization of a, of a, a handshake agreement. It is the most flexible and revocable of all sorts of uh, agreements of this nature, and it essentially um, gives the, the property owner a lot of latitude in saying, this isn't working out, we're going to pull out of it. And it's often used as a first kind of step towards incrementally moving towards something that's more permanent, such as an easement. Um, so these are um, very low risk on both sides, um, but they enable us to go in and do some trail management and some trail maintenance um, with landowner approval. And, um, you know, if things work out over time, we hope that this will actually eventually evolve into a more permanent uh, easement situation. Mm -hmm. So it's a first step on the road towards that kind of truly permanent um, um, 
uh, securing a public access for this property. Great, thank you for the presentation. Bless you. Uh, is there a motion to accept this licensure agreement with the Canterbury at the Cape Condominium Association? Jessica? I so move. Is there a second? Second. Sarah? Any discussion? All those in favor? Unanimous. Thank you very much. And uh, I, I will say that the Conservation Committee would be more than happy to arrange a uh, walk that the uh, Town Council could join us on out there to see uh, just uh, what you've authorized. It's a really remarkable place. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your work on both of these. Thank you, as uh, Maureen said, to the Bryants and also to the uh, members of the Cape uh, Canterbury at the Cape Condominium Association. If I just could say that, that yeah. you know, working working with a camp condominium association is, is a first for us, and Fred Sprague is the president of the association. I met most of the people at one point or another in meetings here. Uh, the Conservation Committee had a joint site walk with them. Uh, this is one of those rare times when this might be a win-win for both parties. So it's, it really is exciting. Great. Thank you very much. I think you're done, Maureen. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm getting this out of your way. I am, I am done. Uh, next item is number 27-2017, a recommendation from the Recycling Committee. I see uh, Bob Malley and two members of the Recycling Committee here. I don't know if any or either of you wants to. Could I say something? I don't know if this is the appropriate time, but I own a retail establishment in town that this impacts. Okay. And it so is the appropriate time. And so I don't know how, I mean, I can be objective around it, but I, I feel that uh, this does have a significant, it does have an impact on my retail establishment. So I don't know how you want me to handle that. Um, in any of these cases, it's the council to decide. So um, do you, is, is there anything else you wanted to add about what that is or no? Jessica? I would ask, uh, how significant of an impact and in what manner that Councillor Jordan feels that she has? I, I would say that it starts putting new procedures in place. And so uh, it just is those kind of processes that I would need to consider. We, we had to do the same thing at our South Portland establishment. Uh, it's not that it's uh, cumbersome, but I just know that uh, it's a process that we'll have to put in place. We'll need to make decisions on, on new, um, new bags, and we always sell reusable bags anyway. Um, I, I think I can be objective around it, uh, but I just wanted to disclose that. Caitlin? Well, I would have a similar disclosure. I don't own an establishment, but my family does. Um, and then I'm not sure. This, at this level of the vote, it, we're just referring it to the Ordinance Committee, mm -hmm. and I guess it would depend on what the Ordinance Committee comes back with as to what level it impacts, because I know some of the ordinances developed in Portland and South Portland, they have exemptions for farms, farm stands, farm markets. So it, if the Ordinance Committee ended up going in such a direction, it could have little impact. Right. So at, at this level of our vote, I feel as though, you know, I can be objective enough because you just don't know if it's even going to have an impact. Jessica? Well, we might need the manager's advice. It's my understanding that in issues of conflict of interest or potential conflict of interest, if the council determines there is one or if a councilor brings one up, then that and going forward in any discussion of that item, the, the counselor who has the conflict cannot participate no matter what stage. So I, we probably need a little help with that from, from the town manager. Is that, am I correct on that, I, I think? No, if, I, if that's the case. No, that, that's correct. I, I, you know, on, on the issues of conflict, the, the traditional council way of handling it is a counselor uh, discloses a conflict and the council then decides at that point, based on the, that available information, and it goes on that basis until there's new information comes forward that there's a reason to change that. I think what you're saying, Jessica, just to clarify for everybody, is that you can't cherry pick what you feel is a conflict or not. Right. Yes. And at which point you want to exercise the That's fact correct. That there the, may be a the, conflict. Yes, you, you have a conflict or you don't, and you can't decide later that, you know, 
Yes. And, yes. and I think I'm saying something different. I think you can decide later if, in fact, an new issue takes a certain turn or there's new information that comes forward. But once you decide there's a conflict, then that, that conflict remains to the end of the issue. Okay. But if there's, if there's a decision of no conflict, there could still be one a finding later on that there's one. So the item on the agenda is to receive the recommendation, and as Caitlin said, in all likelihood, refer that to the Ordinance Committee. So that's what we're deciding as part of tonight's meeting. So I'm going to ask if anybody feels that either Councillor Jordan has a conflict to consider that item. Jessica. Well, I, I'm not sure. I think it needs discussion because as I read, as I read the recommendation, it occurred to me that, and we may need to discuss this, that it is possible that there is an intent to exempt farms from this. I, I, and if that's the case, then, then we may have a conflict of interest. Other comments? I, I don't know. I just, what, are, what, are other, what do other comments yeah, think? Agree. Um, if there is an intent, and I, I read the same thing, if there's an intent to exempt farms, then, yeah, there's a conflict. Exactly. Yeah. Sarah? Actually, because actually, so, I just heard you not oh, sorry. In, in agreement. I mean, if, if you're affirming the conflict, I think we can stop the conversation. Okay. Right. I just, uh, and it could be that I, I try to uh, be very true to uh, when I know that I have a, uh, I have a retail business in town, I understand that this is being referred to the ordinance committee. I understand that. Um, I will say the same thing when it comes back from the ordinance committee, that I have a retail establishment in town. And, um, and that puts Caitlin in a very precarious situation because I'm saying what I feel and uh, at this point, um, I'm kind of hmm. at the point where I go, is it a conflict for me? Sarah? I'm just a hypothetical question. So given what Mike said, that at any point you can choose to recuse yourself or bring this up again, is it a little premature to do it now? Because I know I, for one, would like to hear your guys' input on how this would impact you. I mean, I just think that's educational for us. And since we're, since we're just refer, potentially referring it to the Ordinance Committee, it's, it, it hasn't even been crafted, really. We're not, there, there's, there's no decision making tonight about the content of it, about whether it's going to be exempt or whether it's not, or et cetera, et cetera. So to me, I would, I would, I would like to have you guys in the conversation until you feel that you shouldn't be in the conversation, at which point you can always recuse yourself. That's just my opinion, because I actually would like to hear how it impacts it. I just want to point out, thank you, I just want to point out, to the, it, it's up to the council as a whole to decide whether or not we feel there's a conflict. It's, I appreciate both councilors Jordan suggesting that um, there may be one, but then it's up to the entire council to decide whether there is one or not, whether or not they feel like they need to pull out at any point. Ka Caitlin, go ahead. Oh, just a, um, when it comes down to it, there's, there's going to be a conflict. So my question, I guess, is going to be, are you, once you're recused out, I mean, the problem becomes we're the main voices for two of the three major, two of the four major farms in the community. So are you then not allowed to speak as a member of the public either? Because as Sarah is saying, she'd like to hear what our point of view is. So I guess I, I'm agreeing that, you know, it's, you can't be sitting in the decision, as Jessica is saying, and, and be advocating for our position. But I do also hear what Sarah is saying is, is she'd like to hear from us. So I'm asking as the rules, point of order rules, I guess, can you be recused and then be able to speak as a member of the public, or are you not allowed to because I remember when we recused Jamie off of the gun club, he wasn't allowed to speak at all. Mike, can you give us a clarification on yes, that? Yes, on, on that question, no one ever loses their right to speak as a, as a member of the public. 
the, the, the good practice always is that when you do so, and when this item is being discussed, that you go sit in the audience. Right. That you, you not be sit, you not give your opinion while you're sitting here. And similarly, for example, at an ordinance committee meeting, that if, if the public is sitting separate from the committee, when this item is being discussed, you sit with, with the public and not with the committee. Then Thank to you. make it easier, I think that, yes, Penny and I both need to recuse ourselves off of this item. What? We, we have to recuse ourselves off of this item as it, I mean, either direction it goes, you're going to be arguing right. for something. Kathy? I'm going to um, take a little bit of a different stance here, and I'm going to suggest that um, before we continue the discussion that we have a motion um, to the recycling committee recommendations. I'm happy to make the motion um, for discussion purposes only. Um, so um, if, if the council, council chair would so desire, I'd like to make a motion that we accept the recycling committee's recommendation. Is there a second? Do we want that? Add and refer it to the ordinance committee. We want to just accept it first. Uh, that's fine. Whatever their their recommendation includes that. So, oh. does it? Does it not? Uh, okay. And refer to the um, ordinance committee. Thank you, Kathy. Is there a second? I'll second that. Patty, um, before we go on with discussion, I'd love to hear from the recycling committee folks that are sitting here. Point um, of order. So I'd like to settle the matter on the recusal um, so that we can get to the important work that they've done. No, I, I what, point yeah. of order, Chairman, Go ahead. Chairman. Uh, I, if the manager could please check, it's my understanding that an issue of conflict of interest has to be resolved before any further action can be taken. Yeah, I think that's the period. Correct. That's, yeah, that's, that's, that's what you said. said. So, okay, I, I'm I, sorry, I thought you, yeah, you... You said let's resolve it. So I said let's, let's resolve it so that we can, because I'd like... Conflict of interest? Right, I'd like to get to I'm hearing sorry. the report. I misunderstood you. No, no, no. no. Um, so do you want a motion? Yeah. That Councillor Caitlin Jordan, Councillor Penny Jordan need to be recused from this item. Mm -hmm. Is there a second? I'll second. Jessica? Yep. Any discussion on that beyond what we've already discussed? All those in favor? Do you vote on your own recusal? No. I don't think so. Okay, thank you. Um, you guys are excused from this for the moment. Anybody from the recycling committee like to speak to this? Not, I mean, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but no, I, you guys did a lot of work and I, I don't want... Well, we, you know, Aubrey and I are discussing the fact that um, Matt, um, Matt's last name, um, was the one who really did the lion's share of the work, and so we're not necessarily prepared to address the council at this time. Um, we just thought we were, we're just kind of here to see that it's going, that it passes on to be recommended to go to the ordinance committee. So we're just hoping that I wasn't that. trying to put you on the spot, but I also <laughs> diminish the work that you all have done. No, thank you. I uh, did our acrobatics up here. Right. No, that's, I understand uh, where the Jordans are coming from. Absolutely. So, um, Aubrey, do you have anything to add? No? Okay, cool. Thank you so, very much, thanks. Jen. Appreciate it. That was Jen McDonald from the recycling committee, by the way. Sorry. Two minutes. Any discussion, Kathy? Yeah. Um, one of the things I was kind of curious about, and it might just be because I don't know, but um, I saw in um, the uh, agenda that there were proposed ordinances, and I was a little confused because usually ordinances are not proposed by committees. They're, um, a proposal is come from, comes from a committee, it then comes to the council, and the council sends it to the ordinance committee, and the ordinance committee puts forward an ordinance. So I was sort of like, hmm, okay, there's ordinances in here, and where did they come from? Who proposed them? I mean, I just might be lost and, you know, confused. I can do that. Um, but I, uh, I was a little, um, like, confused about why 
what came to the council was a proposed ordinance where it was not coming from the ordinance committee. It had not gone to the ordinance committee. So maybe somebody can answer that. Um, I don't know. Uh, I'll just say for myself how I read them as being. Bob Malley's here to. Bob, do you want to speak? If, if he wants it. They're all looking at they're all looking I don't at know if him. I can save the day here or not, but uh, I think is one of the council goals was to consider a ban on plastic bags and polystyrene containers. So the committee took it upon themselves to uh, package it in an ordinance format. I think with the understanding that once it went to the ordinance committee, working with Maureen and the ordinance committee, it might be reformatted, but it really was a way to get the document sort of started in a format that you're traditionally, uh, you know, that you would look at in a traditional format. So I think that's the reason why it looks like it does, just as a starting point. Okay. Thank you, Bob. You're welcome. Thanks, Bob. Patty? Yeah, my question is, if, um, with reading what's here, when we do send this to the Ordinance Committee, and we'll work with Maureen and, and certainly Bob, would the uh, Recycling Committee have the opportunity to come and give some of the rationale and some of the background data of where these decisions are? It's kind of just the... Um, the, the heavy lifting of why we should be doing this um, and agreeing to it. And so I'm, I'm seeing yeses, and they'll be coming to do that. That would be helpful, I would think. Sarah? I'm just going to go broad strokes here and say that to thank the, the recycling committee and to say I'm really excited that we're having this conversation. We're now the only community um, <laughs> left that hasn't done this, and we're surrounded by communities, all of which have done it, and it seems to be going smoothly, and it just seems to me environmentally so clear that it's a direction we should try very hard to go in. I mean, it's, it's been incredibly effective. If you shop at Hannaford now, you notice 90% of the people walk in with their reusable bags instead of walking out with 15 plastic bags. That just seems like such a win-win to me. So I'm really excited about it. I was there at the beginning when they were talking about it. I give them kudos for their bravery. I know that they've um, gone through a lengthy process of talking to everyone that they can in the stores and in the schools and every stakeholder that um, they thought might be impacted at least to get their input and to get the process started. Obviously, it's far from um, polished, but I just wanted to say that I'm very excited that it's on our desk, and I will definitely, with enthusiasm, be supporting it. Thank you. Is there any other discussion? Jessica. Um, I, uh, I appreciate the environmental issues, and I've been studying Casco Bay watershed and estuary. However, um, I have some serious concerns about this as it's presented. It seems very heavy-handed to me. Cape Elizabeth is a small town. We have just a handful of retail uh, uh, establishments, um, and um, I'm, I'm not enthusiastic. Um, even though I appreciate the environmental impact and the work of the Recycling Committee, I, I just was a little taken aback, um, again, at the very heavy-handed, what I view as heavy-handed um, components to this. Uh, so, and, uh, and I'm, I'm just, I have some concerns. I mean, I'm certainly, um, you know, uh, willing to, to pass this on to ordinance for review, but um, I just, you know, think this is going to take some, some deep diving because Again, we are a small town, and I don't think that, uh, you know, we have a handful of establishments, and I'm, I'm really not sure if this is nece necessary to this extent, I guess is what I want to say. Um, I just want to remind that we're, um, at this point, just talking about whether to refer it to the Ordinance Committee. Um, appreciative of your comments, but I just want to remind everybody about what we're considering. Um, and I secondly just wanted to go, um, on record as um, saying I appreciated, um, especially since they were effectively, you know, um, reiterations of ordinances from surrounding communities, just having something to react to. I don't think the recycling committee was in any way trying to, um, you know, usurp the powers of the ordinance committee to craft the ordinance itself, but rather to just have something, um, you know, for us to follow and, and have a loose understanding of, of what it was we were talking about here. So that's um, how I interpreted it, and I appreciate <coughs> that in this context. Um, Jane, can I just ask one more question? Go ahead. About, so 
Um, so because I know that, so Jessica, you have a, a concern. I know that uh, Matt, in his due diligence of this, you know, I think he polled every retailer in, in the community and he had positive responses from, I think, everyone. If, um, so, but in, to Patty's point earlier, um, before it goes to ordinance, you, would you, you'd like to, to have the recycling committee present some more background and, and sort of that due diligence and what he found in, in, in what, how, the process that we went through to come to this? Personally. Just so that I understand and that we can go back to the committee. Uh, yeah, um, yeah. I personally, um, being part of the ordinance committee, would like to have all the data points so I can have um, some background. Okay. So as we use this as a jumping off point, and whether or not I can, we can work some collaborative um, work together. I would think uh, for us to move forward, this we need would need to be thoroughly informed by you, the great. committee that did all the heavy lifting. So okay, great. That. Okay, good. Okay, I just wanted to. May I may I address Jim's comments? Please. Yep. Yeah, and I appreciate that. I read actually your entire year's minutes. To see how all this evolved, I knew it was a you know it was a goal put forth by one yes. of the councilors, and I and I know the role that, that one of your committee men members played in it. I my concern is on is for the citizenry. Okay, that's my concern. Right. Thank gotcha. You. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Are there any other comments? All those in favor of the motion on the table to refer the recycling committee recommendation on single-use plastic bags and polystyrene plastics, uh, uh, styrofoam rather. Uh, to the Ordinance Committee. Thank you very much. Thank you all for your work on the effort. Appreciate it. Appreciate you being here. <clears throat> Next up is item number 28-2017, uh, proposed emergency moratorium on non-medical marijuana retail establishments. Patty, do you want to introduce this? Yeah, sure. Um so as you know, the citizens of Maine recently voted to legalize uh, mar marijuana. And you have before you for your consideration, uh, drafted by our town attorney, an emergency ordinance enacting a 90, or proposing to enact a 90-day moratorium on retail marijuana businesses. Um, in order for this moratorium to go into effect, uh, five of us, seven counselors, need to approve it um, this evening. Um, so the, primary, the background and the primary reason a moratorium is needed is that particularly all of our surrounding communities have enacted them, um, and Portland being the largest. And because of this, um, there could be significant impacts um, to Cape Elizabeth if we become the area destination um, for uh, what is permitted with the marijuana and um, retail marijuana businesses. Um, so instead, what we'd like to do is um, just kind of hit the pause button, the first thing, and then hopefully tonight adopt this 90-day moratorium and use that time to um, refer this issue to the Ordinance Committee and to really look at the, and consider and look at the larger issue and its impact on the citizens of Cape Elizabeth. So with that, I'll open up, um, I'll make a motion. We can, you guys, we can certainly discuss it. Is, um, I move to adopt an emergency moratorium on non medical marijuana retail establishments in order to study the impacts of the recent vote regarding retail sales of marijuana and to refer the issue to the Ordinance Committee for further study. Thank you, Patty. Is there a second on that motion? Jessica? A second. Discussion? I have a bunch of questions. Penny? Um, first is, I've read the whole thing and um, it defines retail business as it, it starts talking about cultivation. So when I initially started reading this, I thought it was about establishments relative to sale. So is this to cover cultivation as well for uh, uh, cannabis that is targeted for retail distribution? Mike, I'll try. You can tell me if I'm right. I'm thinking it's covering any type of business, any type of sale, anything for 90 days so that the Ordinance Committee can look at and get a handle on what all of that looks like. I think um, it's very different than the days past what, the re what retail looks like and distribution and manufacturing. Mike, is that correct? Yeah, just, you know, this moratorium was drafted by John Wall, um, one of our town attorneys, and it's, as the, the first whereas indicates, it's a the intent is uh, to simply deal with those issues 
that are in the Marijuana Legalization Act that was apparently approved by the voters on November 8. Uh, the third whereas indicates that it in no way limits privileges or rights uh, afforded by the main Medical Use of Marijuana Act. So therefore, you know, if the cultivation is in fact for retail sale, is something that's mentioned in Title VII and it is expressly permitted, uh, this would provide for more term. So what if it is targeted for retail sale outside of the boundaries of Cape Elizabeth? Let's uh, see what it oh, does. Section 4, if I may, James uh, uh, Council. Uh, go ahead, Jessica. A uh, moratorium in the location, establishment, operation, or licensing of retail marijuana businesses for 90 days from the date of the ordinance or is enacted. That's what this does. The next a moratorium on the location, establishment, operational licensing of retail marijuana businesses. And a, a retail it's marijuana something. business is defined as marijuana, retail marijuana social clubs and retail marijuana establishments, including retail marijuana stores, retail ma mar marijuana cultivation facilities, mm -hmm. retail marijuana product manufacturing facilities, and retail mar marijuana testing facilities, as those terms are defined by uh, the act approved by the voters. Okay. Well, s Caitlin? So we could take out retail marijuana cultivation facilities for, as Penny's suggesting, which would allow people to grow but have it for sale outside of town of Cape Elizabeth. Yeah. You know, I, I think the interpretation would be people can grow for medical marijuana activities, but, you know, as this indicates, uh, there would be a moratorium on retail marijuana cultivation facilities. Right. I'm saying an option, I'm just saying, is you could strike that, that for those four words from the definition and then move forward with the rest of it. The council can do whatever it wants with this item. Exactly. To clarify, though, the definition aligns with what's outlined. Yeah. It, 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 it'll, it is intended right. to align with the the, uh, what the voters approved in yeah. November 8th. Okay. Sarah, did you have a question or comment? I guess I was just going to say 90 days doesn't seem like that long to me. Why don't we just uh, adapt it, uh, you know, and, and then, I mean, obviously in 90 days we're going to have this, we're going to have far more lengthy discussion about this entire thing. But right now, it's, we could sit here for half an hour and debate what we should take in or out, but it's 90 days and, and, and it's the dead of winter, so I'm just saying why don't we just, why don't we just go for 90 days, hope that we get all our work done, and then in 90 days we'll know. I mean, it's more time. It's, it's, you don't, I don't feel like we should cherry pick it. I feel like we should just, if we agree, we should do it, and if we don't agree, we should. Mike? Yeah, under, under the, the provisions of the charter, you can only adopt a, a, an amendment to the zoning ordinance, which this would be, after a public hearing, after referral to the planning board, after all these items. You couldn't adopt this without having done that. Uh, so therefore, you need, the other option is the, the emergency moratorium option, and you can do it for 90 days, and then you can, you can also do it again and extend it for additional 90-day periods until you resolve this. And this is according to the charter. The charter allows, you, says you can do this for not to exceed 90 days. Relative to the growing season, I think we're hyping <laughs> an option too. So I've heard, Patty. I guess I would just feel like before we start striking things, the town attorney is just trying to cover us so that we don't end up allowing something that gets through the door that we may not want in this community. Perhaps we do. I don't know. I feel like we need to put up, the, as I said, the pause button so we can get information and really know what that looks like. And so it's just, a, just allowing us to have the information doesn't mean that we're not going to allow these things to happen. It just, we just want to be informed before we allow them, Same if at all. Caitlin? My question was, um, Mike touched on it, that you can just keep doing, is there a limit to how many times we can enact a 90 day, 90 day? Or does it, I'm just wondering how much pressure it puts on the ordinance committee right. to, you know, meet next month and hit the ground running, or can you just, go on forever having moratoriums every three months? Mike? You know, I'm going to take the, the, the rare moment of, of hunting. I, I haven't specifically asked the town attorney that question, and I, I think it's something that the ordinance committee should get some advice on. 
Other comments, questions? I personally think that there's, uh, it, it makes a lot of sense to just uh, wait and learn all of the different implications of this. I don't think anybody's saying no uh, definitively uh, or writing anything in stone, so I see no reason why we shouldn't um, uh, take the time needed to examine what seems to be an extremely complicated question, not the least of which is an ongoing recount around you know, whether or not it's even going to pass to begin with. So. Um, for that and several other reasons, I think we should um, move forward with this emergency moratorium. Seeing no other discussion, all those in favor? Thank you. Next item is number 29-2017, Hazard Mitigation Plan. Mike, could you introduce yes. this for us? Every so often, uh, FEMA requires us to update the hazardous mitigation plan. We do it as a county. In this instance, they consulted with Bob Malley and with Charlie Kennedy, our director of uh, emergency management. Uh, the hazards that were identified for the region are flooding, coastal flooding, severe summer storms, and severe winter storms. There's lesser hazards that are possible but aren't considered, you know, the top hazards. Those include such things as earthquakes and landslides and even hurricanes because the, the reality is our summer storms and winter storms are worse than any hurricane we've had in a long time. But anyway, I would urge you to uh, approve this and uh, there were materials online that uh, outlined uh, the process that was utilized to get to this point. Thank you, Mike. Uh, could I have a motion to adopt the hazard mitigation plan as Mike just explained it to us? Sarah? So moved. Second. Jessica? Yep. Any discussion? <coughs> All those in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you very much. Next item, number 30-2017, Fort Williams Park Capital Fund, new proposed allocations. Mike, are you going to speak to this? I don't see anybody. And Robert's here for the, the details of it. Uh, I, for, I forgot gonna, the multiple hats. You're going to tee this one off? I'll pitch it for Mark Russell, who's uh, unable to be here tonight. Um, as part of their budget planning process, the Fort Williams Park Committee met in November and prior to that and developed a list of projects uh, for your consideration. <coughs> if you look at the projects that are uh, teed up here, they all are safety uh, themed or uh, maintenance related. And the f sense was that because the fund balance is healthy, uh, that we could move forward with these uh, in the spring and get them done before June 1st, rather than wait till the budget adoption, which should make them uh, uh, have to happen after July 1st. Uh, there are other projects that you will see as part of their budget submittal uh, when you, uh, after the first of the year. But these were all felt that, uh, that we, we could achieve some economies, get some good prices on bids, uh, in getting those bids out this winter and getting prices for contractors looking for work in the spring. So I can explain or answer questions on the projects uh, here for consideration if you'd like. Or. Bob, could you, uh, the Wheatley Road guardrail, which I'm just, can you place where that is? So, yes, that's the road that leads up to the former fire station. Uh, it's now used for overflow parking and if you go up about halfway, there's a significant drop off on the right hand side or the northerly side of the road. And we really feel that now that we're encouraging cars to go up there and park, where before it was really just used for special events, that we ought to address the issue of, of protecting that drop off and protecting that slope that's there. And it's the primary parking now for the children's garden. So again, we are encouraging more people to, to transit that road. I had another question too. Um, the stairs adjacent to the children's garden leading down to the ball field. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't, I, I was curious about not including any work on those. We actually are installing railings on those stairs. Uh, we've already signed a proposal that work may happen uh, in the next couple of weeks, but it will definitely happen in the spring. But there's actually uh, four more sets of railings that are going in two along Wheatley Road that are on the north side of the road and one at the council ring or the stone gazebo and one on the stairs that you just referenced. Great. Other questions for Bob? Sarah? 
Um, when will we see or discuss other proposals for other projects or updates? Um, the Park Committee is going to be on their agenda for January or draft agenda is just consideration of capital planning projects. So I know you had referenced the amphitheater and the existing bleachers. What's the disposition of those going to be? And that's sort of part of, uh, part of all their, their global discussion of larger projects that they'll be undertaking after the first of the year. So, yeah, we'll talk about that. Okay, great. Any other questions? Thank you, Bob. You're welcome. Is there a motion to approve the request for allocation from the Fort Wayne Park Committee? Jessica? I so move. Second. Sarah, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Thank you very much. <laughs> Item number 31-2017, next phase of the combined sewer overflow mitigation project. Mr. Malley. Um, some of you may recall that we've been working with, in cooperation with the Portland Water District in the City of South Portland to uh, eliminate the Ottawa Road CSO, uh, which is uh, an overflow that occurs down at the Ottawa Road pumping station when we have a significant rain event. Uh, we are under an agreement with the main DP. Uh, I think this is, we're nearing year five of our five year plan to eliminate the CSO. Uh, for the last couple of years, we've worked on, we've installed uh, some infrastructure to accommodate uh, connections from homes that are considered to have illicit connections or sump pump connections to the sanitary sewer, which again, when we get a heavy rain event, uh, taxes out the pump station down on Ottawa Road. The infrastructure itself is all in place now. Uh, we, that was uh, uh, enabled by a home inspection program, which we did in year one to determine which homes had sump pumps uh, connected to the sanitary system. So we essentially installed stubs from uh, storm drain systems or extensions of storm drain systems to enable those future connections. We're at the point now where that was, I wouldn't say it was the low hanging fruit, but that was the easy part. The, the tough part now is getting those connections uh, made at the street line or at the property line from homes, getting those sump pumps into and piped into this, this network of, of pipes that we've put in. And we looked at, you know, what's the best way to do this? Uh, some communities have taken an approach where, nope, you've got to get them out by ordinance. You know, we're not going to enable or not going to subsidize the cost of it. Some have uh, partially subsidized the cost of doing it. And some of these connections, uh, we have estimates from our consultants. They range anywhere from $1,000 to $17 to $20,000. It was going to be a burden on some of the residents. We uh, were sure that they didn't have those funds to, to make those connections. And discussing this with the town manager, we thought, what's the best way to do this? So we meet our obligations with the plan and get these connections out. And we felt that the sewer fund uh, balance uh, you know, was healthy and that the funds from the sewer fund would pay for these connections. Well, it's proposed to work with a consultant to manage the program, uh, Wright Pierce, who we've been working with from day one on the home inspection program, to help us and assist us with the program, uh, putting bids out, uh, getting a contractor to make these connections inside homes with the proper easements and permissions that we would need to work on private property. So uh, I think it's a good approach and it meets our obligations uh, in the plan and our requirements with the main DEP. And uh, I would propose that uh, we move forward uh, with the proposal. Thank you, Bob. Is there a motion to authorize the expenditure of $320,000 from the sewer fund to accomplish the plan that Bob just outlined for us? So moved. Second. Second. Caitlin, any discussion? Seeing none. Oh, Jessica, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, um, you know, dealing with combined sewer overflow is, is a huge deal with water quality um, and all those ecosystems. And, you know, I, I feel somewhat conflicted dedicating taxpayer dollars for individual homes However, uh, I will be supporting this because I think the, in all practicality, expecting as many homes as are actually involved in getting this done is uh, 
would be extremely difficult. So it's a lot of money and it does bug me, but I think we need to do it. So. Yeah, just to clarify, there are no taxpayer dollars involved. These are all sewer user fees that are paying for 100% of this. But don't we, but where did our sewer user fees come from originally? Sewer user fees come from people, citizens who pay them. Okay. And businesses who pay them. But there aren't any property tax dollars. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion on the table? Thank you very much. Right. Thank you, Bob. Thank you very much. Next item is 32-2017, the closeout of the Community Services Fund. Mike, could you please speak to this item? Yeah, the Community Services Department has merged into it as a municipal department. It was formerly a special fund, sort of a hybrid between the school and the town. Uh, when the change took effect on June 30, 2016, uh, and the books were closed in last year, the Community Services Program had a deficit of 32485 It is proposed to close that fund by absorbing the 32485 deficit in the general fund, which means the taxpayers will be paid for the deficit. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Is there a motion to close out the Community Services Fund? So moved. Patty? Second. Caitlin seconds. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Thank you very much. Next item, number 33-2017, the Cape Care Playground. Mike, do you want to speak briefly yeah, to this? Yeah, the Cape Care Playground is a playground that's on the left as you're going down the back, towards the back of the high school, sort of across the tennis courts there. Uh, it's been in place there about 25 years. The, the playground that's there is been falling apart day by day, year by year, month by month. And uh, plans were developed to, to do a new playground. Uh, the budgetary estimate for that is 75,000. It's out for bid. Uh, the council had earlier provided 50,000. And I'm proposing that you allocate 25,000 from the unassigned fund balance in order to uh, complete the project and uh, have good safe equipment for the preschoolers uh, down there. Thank you, Mike. I just wanted to ask a question to clarify the so everybody's aware the scope has not changed it's just that the cost of that original scope was more than was originally budgeted correct i i think that's fair but you know i, I when we asked for the original money it was sort of a this is what we think it might cost i, I really don't think there was a specific scope uh, that had been identified as of that point thank you is there a motion to allocate an additional $25,000 from the unassigned fund balance to complete this project? So moved. Caitlin, second? Second. Sarah, any discussion? Can I ask you a question? Sarah. Um, why don't these kids use the school playgrounds? And, and further walk? Why aren't they using the one? Aren't they, isn't this an after school program? This one is, is actually designed for the very youngest okay. kids. Okay. Uh, you know, I think there's a, you know, there's, there's like a boat or something involved in it, you know, things that real, the preschool is really like. And it's also, you know, it's called the Cape Cap Playground, but it's, a, it's available to all preschoolers, uh, you know, at, at times that they're not using it. It's not just after school, it's the, the preschool. preschool program. During the day. Daycare. Okay. Kathy? Do we know approximately how many children this is servicing? How many um, Cape Care kids will be using this? How many people are, is it servicing? You know, you know, I don't know the exact number, but there's probably uh, you know 25 to 30 kids uh, when that's in session. And, you know, if you look at the population of Cape Elizabeth, we we roughly have what about 100 kids start school every year. So, you know, really we're looking at, uh, you know, a, 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 a pool of about 100. Plus, we also have other people that come in that, you know, with little kids and, uh, you know, it's, it's not the largest group. But, but again, it's where, where kids get started. Thank you. I would just say, too, that like any of the playgrounds in town, it's not, there's no specific dedicated user group. I mean, I see plenty of young kids on the middle school playground for example, at any given time of the day. So um, 
Patty? I was just going to say that I think we, we as you said, you already, we've already allocated 50, correct? And it's, under, right. it's underway. So to me, this makes complete sense. It's, um, it's one of those beautification projects, projects that's for young children. Um, it, we're, they're looking to, it was an estimate, and um, also noting that we are saving $8,000 on the van. Um, so it, it's really just, um, you know, the total of $17,000, again, that is for funding for the, the use of the community at large. And um, so I'm for this. I'm going to vote for it. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion on the table? Thank you. Next item, number 34-2017, access to Crescent Beach for watercraft. Yeah, we, we have a, a ramp that goes down to Crescent Beach that is very steep. It's washing out all the time. It's very difficult to navigate. There's, a, there's, a, there's some uh, storm drain lines down on the beach. And if you get down it, if the storm, if the water's flowing rapidly, uh, you really can't get to the part of the beach where the, the boats need to get. Uh, so we, we had a meeting, as I mentioned, I think the last council meeting, uh, with the state. We we're going to meet with them. Uh, and, and they seem more than willing for the first time to consider returning to the, the, the historic site where this ramp uh, used to be. And uh, what I'd like to do is just get authorization to write to the state to, in, to, for, to encourage them to further engage in the dialogue, and then this will be further explored by the Harpers Committee and the town manager uh, in the months ahead. Thank you, Mike. Is there a motion to authorize the manager to write the state park director for this dialogue? So, so moved. Second. Sarah moved. Caitlin second. <laughs> Any discussion? Jessica. Yep, uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm supportive of doing this. I just recall um, the, in 2014, the town was notified of the possibility of piping clovers in that area, so I'm sure that if that is still a concern, they will be letting, letting us know. You know, in, in this particular area, particularly on state parkland, they review all those issues prior to 20 to him. Okay. Any other discussion or questions? Seeing none, all those in favor? Thank you very much. Item number 35-2017, the lease renewal for the Edward Jones office. One, one of, I do disclose that I'm a client of Edward Jones. Uh, one, one of the our best tenants, so is Edward Jones. Uh, they've, they've been down there. I think this would be, uh, this would make at least 20 years if this five-year five -year lease is approved. <laughs> Uh, the revenues would be a little over 90000 over the, the five-year term. Uh, this is in the, the front of the community services, uh, <coughs> the office building in front of the community center. Uh, so it's proposed. And, and also, it, we do need to do some upgrades that they've negotiated as part of the lease to, to do them up front of 15500 uh, to do a little bit, bit of painting, a little bit of repair. And uh, so what I'd like to do is uh, ask you to authorize the manager to sign the lease and to expend up to 15500 for the unassigned fund balance for improvements and updating to the building at 343 Ocean House Road. Thank you, Mike. Is there a motion for the approval of the lease renewal and the allocation of the funds being requested? So moved. Caitlin, second. Second. Penny, any discussion? Patty. I guess I have a quick question. The um, fifteen thousand five hundred dollars that were um, to do the improvements, do you, were those are these special things or are they just things that probably it's should have been done anyways? It's, they should have been done anyways. Yeah, it's routine stuff. Okay. Other, my second oh, question. One of the things is we're removing the old satellite dish that's oh. been outside there too. Okay. So these are really things that would improve the overall look for the community. Yeah. And then the second thing is. Um, do, do people, when they, when they rent for five years, is there some type of break on the lease that we offer? Or is it the same, it just, we're just doing it for five years? Is there a break cost-wise for them when they lease for five years versus a one-year period? You know, it, it's a it's lease with, with a, you know, there's a, I think it's a cop, there's an escalator clause. Okay. You know, so much, it usually goes up by a couple of percent every year. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Kathy? So if I'm understanding, the new lease is going to increase by $1 a month? 
Is that my understanding? From fourteen forty nine a month to fourteen fifty a month? I think at the first one. Per <clears throat> so I just want to understand. We're going to increase the, for the first year. We're going to increase it by one dollar, but we're going to spend fifteen thousand dollars to improve the building. Fifteen two or fifteen five? I'm not sure. I'm reading the memo that you sent on December sixth, but maybe what we're talking about. So I'm just I'm. Okay, I just want to make sure I understand. Yeah, the, the first year is very close and then it, it escalates thereafter. Okay, thank you. Other questions, comments? Mike, do you know how long it's been since some of these improvements were made in the building, roughly? The, the particular improvements that we're talking, you know, haven't been done in 15 years. Yeah. So there are things that would need to be done, whether or not Edward Jones was renewing or oh, yeah. probably any other If it tenant. was another tenant, would have tenant fed up. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion to approve the lease and expend the repair money? Thank you. And item number 36-2017, the capital stewardship plan. You have something for us, Mike? Yeah, I've got paper copies if anyone wants, but we have a, every year the council asks me to do an update for the next 10 years of the capital stewardship plan. Uh, anyone else want a paper copy? Is this one? Yeah. Anyone over there, paper copy? You all? Thank you. No, I had it on the computer. I do too, but I have paper for these things. Anybody want one? Uh, but you know, it, uh, you know, it lays out, uh, <laughs> this is, it has certain strategic objectives. It's to maintain our facilities, roads, sidewalks, grounds, equipment, and good repair in order to protect the investments that the citizens have made in our community, to enhance opportunities for pedestrians in the town center area. Uh, we're looking at uh, cooperating and exploring with South Portland on providing shared fire protection services in the Shore Road, Willard Beach area. And uh, over this plan, we would we would borrow money once more after the current one we're doing for about $2 million, but overall would reduce municipal debt from the current $10.6 million uh, to less than $5 million uh, outstanding in FY 2027. Thank you. Just about the time you'll be looking to return to your post, right? <laughs> you know, this is one of the very first jobs I did as an intern in 1977 was uh, preparing the capital, the five-year capital improvement plan from 1977 to 1982. And to think that we're now out to 2027, <laughs> that makes 50 full years of uh, proposing all sorts of spending. Uh, and uh, happy that uh, I, I'm just putting it out there and someone else is gonna have to deal with it. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like a pretty fitting bookend. I thought so too. And, uh. and, and, and the other thing is, you know, I, if you look at the cover, of the, you know, for those of you who get the picture, th this is really a special picture. Uh, mm -hmm. what, what you're looking at is the inset, is back in the mid-1970s, that is the way the, the area in the lower picture of Fort Williams looked. That's that is what it looked like, only it looked worse than that picture because it was all dilapidated and all falling apart. And what happened when it is the town went in and they filled all, all of that area, with grass and dirt and the sewer project. And what we have is that beautiful field now that, that really gives so much of Fort Williams uh, Park its character. And uh, my very first summer here, they, they had summer staff, I can remember, they had just put the first grass on this lawn and they were trying to, there was crews up there picking out all the rocks that were part of the sod uh, so that it could be mowed, and uh, that was uh, 39 years ago. So anyway, I encourage you to acknowledge receipt of it. Thank you, Mike. Is there a motion to gratefully acknowledge the receipt of the stewardship capital, capital stewardship plan? Jessica. I move that we very gratefully acknowledge receipt of the capital <coughs> stewardship plan for fiscal years 2018 to 2027. Thank you, Jessica. Second. Second. Caitlin, any discussion? All those in favor? 
Great. Uh, I see no members of the public to speak on any thing that was not on the agenda and pertains to Cape Elizabeth local government. So with that, I am seeking a motion to retire into executive session. Somebody read me the language. Jessica, go ahead. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Uh, I move that we, uh, that uh, we enter into executive session in conformance with one uh, main uh, revised. Uh, revised. MRSA, I mean, main what, revised statutes annotated, uh, subsection 4056F to review a request for a poverty abatement. Thank you, Jessica. Is there a second? Patty? All those in favor? All right. Thank you very much. We will meet in executive session.